The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I am your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V, and pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. Hello, Tom. Our first question tonight, Father, is from a viewer who asks about the 1962 version of the Roman Missal. Uh, she says, I'm currently using this, ver this version of the Roman Missal for the Latin Mass. Did I hear Father Jenkins mention that there is another Missal that is better because the 1962 Missal actually has some Vatican II updates in it? I may be mistaken in thinking that. Maybe I misheard him. Is there another Missal that you use there in Norwood? And I would be so appreciative of knowing what that is and where I might purchase a copy. All right. Well, technically speaking, the 1962 missile would not have Vatican II updates mm -hmm. because Vatican II hadn't taken place yet. Uh, nonetheless, the uh, 1962 missile does have John the 23rd changes, initial changes uh, that actually began under Pope Pius XII when he established this committee to change the liturgy. And it worked for 20 years, from 1948 to 1968, to produce the new mass. You know. uh, so the early, early changes of John the 23rd are incorporated into the 1962 Missal, which is why the Vatican, under the modernists, demanded that Archbishop Lefebvre and his Society of St. Pius X accept the 1962 Missal as their norm because uh, it was already an admission that the changes themselves were not based on bad principles. Because all of the changes that occur in the liturgy, in the Mass in particular, um, even the early changes were based on the same principles that carried all the way through to produce the new Mass. So if you accept the early changes of John the 23rd, you're actually in principle accepting the new Mass because you're accepting the principles on which all the changes were made. Okay? The, the principles were enunciated from the very beginning. It's not as though they developed uh, only as time went on. The principles were, were, uh, were bad, and so the new Mass was actually just bad in its origins because those principles, uh, liturgical principles for the new Mass are all wrong, they're bad, they're modernist, they're not Catholic. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the 1962 Missal is not good. There's a reason why the modernists insisted that that be the standard uh, for all of the indult masses and all of the Latin masses they'll approve of. And uh, so, you know, what would we certainly recommend, what I recommend, is that uh, this dear soul uh, go back to a, a missile of the 19, early 1950s, really, uh, any way, uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, before the new so-called restored Rite of Holy Week came out, um, uh, with the very archaeologism that Pius XII condemned, um, so to, to bypass entirely that new restored Rite of Holy Week, and to follow the traditional Mass before the modernists got their uh, modernist myths on, on the liturgy, you know. Um, so, uh, yes, it is possible to uh, find uh, missiles that are printed even today that predate the 1962 changes of John XXIII. Could you give any examples of these, any names of these missiles? Well, one would have to look, um, uh, you know, the Father Lassance, there, it's possible to get a Father Lassance missile, um, uh, which is dated before 1962. Mm -hmm. It's possible to get a St. Andrew's missile, certainly. Uh, St. Andrew's missile would be my first choice. Okay. Okay. Um, if I could get a St. Andrew's missiles from the late 40s, 1940s, or early 1950s, that's what I would do. Be my first choice. There are there are other also uh, you know names of the missiles. Um, I mentioned Father Lassans, Father Stedman. Uh, there is um, uh, the Saint Saint Joseph missile, and so on. Each of these has its own uh, particular good points. But the important thing is to make sure that they predate 
the so-called restored right of Holy Week in 1955 about that. They have to come before that. Otherwise, the changes have already begun to, to infect them. Um, one might say, well, you know, 1955, what could be possible, what could possibly be wrong with that? Um, those are the latter days of Pius the 12th, before John the 23rd got in. Uh, and the answer is simply that the modernists set their sights on the Catholic liturgy for Holy Week, especially for the Triduum of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. And leading modernists actually went on record. They were made no secret about it back in the 30s and 40s. And they said, if we can change the most sacred rites of the church, of the sacred triduum, uh, then we can change everything. I mean, they said it point blank. So let's concentrate on that. Focus all of our efforts on changing the ceremonies of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Because we know if we can succeed there, uh, we will actually succeed in all of our plans to completely, um, well, I guess they would call it renovate the liturgy, but we know it's not really renewing it. It wasn't a renewal at all. It was a uh, destruction of the Catholic liturgy. And the replacement with uh, the modernist, um, well, I, you know, it was, it was said, um, that uh, what uh, Annibale Bonini, the principal architect of the new mass, wanted was a liturgy that appealed to modern, secular, Western man. That's what he said. And the fact that he's modern and secular and Western, I mean, he's already uh, saying that they want a liturgy which is not Catholic by saying all of that. And uh, Jean Guiton, who was a good friend of Paul VI, stated again that uh, his good friend Paul VI wanted a Calvinist liturgy. Not a Catholic liturgy. When, with, the, with the Novus Ordo, he was looking for a Calvinist liturgy that expressed the Calvinist way of believing. <clears throat> and that conforms very, very well <laughs> to um, the statement of the worker with... Um, uh, with uh, uh, Annabelle Benini to have a, a, a liturgy that appeals to the mentality of modern Western secular man. That's a Calvinist liturgy. And that's what the new, the new rite of Mass is. So, uh, again, the principles that led to the new Mass and beyond, because the new Mass is evolving. <coughs> In fact, it represents only the second stage of a five-phase plan to come up with a new liturgy. This is only the second stage. You have three more phases to go to. This is according to my liturgy professor at the Angelicum in Rome. He said that. Um, so they're, they're still working on this new mass. It's still evolving. And uh, pretty soon, the Society of St. Pius X will be in lock, stock, and barrel and evolving with it, too, <laughs> at their rate they're going. Uh, but no, find a, find a missile before 1955, and, and you can be fairly certain that it hasn't been uh, uh, poisoned yet by the modernists. And she asked about purchasing a missile like that. We we have copies of, of these pre-1955. Well, through, the, through the bookstore here, the back to the conception, it's possible to obtain such sure. a missile. Yeah. Uh, we Maybe. have an excellent uh, uh, bookstore director, yeah. works very hard, has excellent stock. Definitely. And... Um, We'd be happy to. You, know, uh, you could even talk to her, Tom, and, and give this dear person a list of what's available. Right. Yeah. Choose yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. We'd be happy to uh, to send something and work work something out there. Hmm. Let's move on to the next question, Father. Uh, this is in regards to uh, the active participation of the dialogue mass, which was touted in the 1950s as a return to ancient customs. Why is this not practiced in a traditional church? Was the idea simply a ruse to promote the meshing of the role of the clergy with that of the faithful? Yes, exactly right. <laughs> the, the last statement, mm -hmm. the question that was made could be a statement to be true. Yeah. I mean, the Catholic understanding was, uh, and by the way, when the modernists themselves talk about ancient practices, ancient practices, this is their fantasies. Okay, these are just reconstructions of somebody's fantasy of the ancient liturgy, you know. I mean, we do, we do have, uh, we do have uh, uh, sacramentaries going back to 600, uh, even into 400, the Leonine Sacramentary, 
which has the, the canon of the of the mass, the true mass, exactly as we have it, the traditional Latin mass. You know. Uh, the last addition to be able to have any words to the canon of the Mass was made by Pope Gregory the Great, and this was uh, at the beginning of the barbarian invasions. I mean, this is when we had the uh, the uh, Lombards, you know, in central Italy, wreaking well, what is now Italy, uh, wreaking havoc and. Uh, all kinds of trouble that uh, the Catholics were facing at the time. And he, uh, he introduced the phrase into the canon, give peace in our days, grant peace in our days. And God ask, he's asking God for peace. That was the last change made in the canon uh, since the year 600 or so. So, um, so when, they, when, the, when the modernists invoke ancient practices, uh, you know, you ask them, don't trust them. Don't trust them. They, 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 it's, it's, it's a ploy, a tactic. It has nothing to do with reality. Remember, when they were trying to foist the myth of hand communion on everybody, and they're quoting from the mystagogic catechesis, mystagogic catechesis of, of um, Cyril of Jerusalem, um, I think it is uh, lesson five um, or six, I think it was five. Uh, I mean, it was already commonly known that what they were quoting uh, was not the work of St. Cyril of Jerusalem at all, but was the work of his successor, a semi-Aryan heretic who became the Bishop of Jerusalem after Cyril. Uh, and what they're, what they're describing there to justify their hand communion was never done by Catholics. Still, by heretics, but by Aryan, Aryan heretics. Uh, so you can't just can't trust them. You know, their their scholarship is entirely sectarian and tendential and self-serving to promote their their um, their false and misleading agenda. But with regard to um, with regard to the question of the dialogue mass. Um, Remember that the, the early masses, when the church came out of the catacombs, uh, you know, the, the early masses, well, I mean, even before they came out of the catacombs, I'm mean, looking at St. Lawrence, right? And, uh, um, you know, church was very, very much still in the catacombs at his time when he was a deacon. And they had the, the clergy serving the liturgy. Uh, the bishop would uh, offer the mass often, right? As the church spread, they would bring more and more priests, so the priests would be offering mass. But in the early days, with the uh, early uh, chapels that were founded, um, the uh, the bishop of the place would offer mass. The clergy would assist him and be with him. Uh, he would serve the mass. The deacons would take the blessed sacrament off to the sick and the uh, imprisoned. But they would also serve the Mass. They were the original servers of the Mass. But they were the clergy, okay? And uh, that is why the Church had them making the responses. As the Church spread, priests were ordained, and uh, then Masses were offered by the priests, spreading more and more uh, on their own, away from you know, the, the, the sea, or the central where the bishop was in residence. They had, again, servers for the Mass. <clears throat> the Church had introduced the minor orders. Start, they started with the diaconate. The deacons were appointed by the Apostles themselves. I mean, you read about that in, Saint, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, I think, I think chapter 4. And um, so that was the first uh, that, again, Peter knew. Peter said, this is what we must do. And that is what they all did, because they knew that he spoke, you know, as a vicar of Christ. They respected that. And uh, so after that, the church appointed subdeacons, and they appointed, um, they appointed acolytes right, to serve the Mass. And the minor orders came to be, over time, exorcist. I mean, early, when I say over time, I don't mean over... Over you know centuries and centuries, I mean in, in short order, the church was as the church spread, she was uh, sharing the powers of holy orders uh, among lesser clergy you know, who were ordained gradually through these steps to the priesthood, and these were the ones who served the mass. Uh, even the the lowest of the minor orders, uh, the porter was someone who was responsible for guarding the church, summoning the faithful to prayer, and so on. 
that he'd be given, even in latter days, the keys of the church to show his responsibility for maintaining the church and for maintaining order and, and securing the, priest, the church. Uh, the lector, you know, the second of the minor orders. This is someone who was ordained to read aloud the lessons of the Old Testament during the Mass. Uh, the exorcist, I mean, we all know what exorcists do, right? And the, the, the acolyte, the subdeacon, and the deacon. I mean, these, these were men who were, uh, had more and more uh, involvement in the liturgy as servers of the Mass. The acolytes were the one, ones who finally were privileged to, to bring the water and the wine to the, to the altar. Um, so it wasn't just, uh, you know, Billy Joe and Betty May who did these things. I mean, it was, these men were, first of all, tonsured as members of the clergy as the first step. And then they began to receive these holy orders. So when you have everybody at the church responding with one voice or 12 or 1200, however many are there, um, you're actually invading the sanctuary. And you're saying everybody is entitled now, clergy or no, you know, it doesn't matter. Everybody's entitled to have his voice in the, in the, in the, in the liturgy. And uh, when they tore out the communion rails and broke down any distinction whatsoever between the sanctuary and the nave of the church, uh, they had already done this by this, indult mass, by this uh, so-called dialogue mass, where everybody's included, everybody has, you know, joins in, and uh, this this was a major step toward the new mass. Right? Um, the, the the rail became something meaningless. The distinction between the sanctuary and the non-sanctuary. Remember, Protestants refer to the whole church as a sanctuary, right? Because there's nothing sacred there. Okay. If everything's sacred, nothing's sacred, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and so the, the Catholic churches began more and more to resemble the Protestant churches in their liturgy and their architecture with the dialogue mass. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the, the next step is to have the people coming up and standing on the altar handing hands, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, holding hands. Mm-hmm. And the altar becomes a table, right? Uh, we're all gathered there for a meal and so on. And then not only do you have people all, you know, it, it, even back then, I mean, we're talking about 1958, everybody's shouting Dominus Obiscum, et comes very you know, if they knew what they were saying. And, uh, and uh, the, next, the next step is, of course, have them start assuming more and more roles of the servers. Well, they're not clergy, right? Bring up the gifts and playing their guitars and all the other stuff. Um, the dialogue mass was a, was a step, a major step in the direction. Breaking down the distinction between the sanctuary and the nave, breaking down the distinction between the clergy and the laity. That's what it's really all about. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, people should have nothing to do with that. Unfortunately, the Society of St. Pius X has been pushing the dialogue mass. And people have suggested, you know, there was, there was a time years and years ago when people were suggesting the Society of St. Pius X is actually just a uh, Trojan horse to, um, <clears throat> you know, gather the traditionalist ranks, would be traditionalist ranks, and, and, and somehow betray them all into the hands of the Novus Ordo. And of course, I would say, no, no, no. I'm sure that's an Archbishop Lefebvre's intention. <clears throat> but the more I see what's going on now, the more I think, well, <clears throat> you know, I can see why the devil would want that. I mean, Satan certainly would try to do that. Right? So um, whether those who are deliberately setting about to, to, to gather the traditional Catholic people who still have the faith and deliver them into the power of Francis and his modernist minions... I don't know if there, you know, if the individuals involved in this have that nefarious idea in mind, but I know someone does. I know Satan does, and he would love to use Society of Saint Pius X to compromise the entire effort of traditional Catholics. Um, so, um, some of the connections, uh, some of the connections, though, on the upper level of the Society of Saint Pius X. Uh, I think that it might very well be that 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 is their purpose. That's scary. Yeah, uh, it is. It is uh, a great concern. I'll tell you this much, though. Whether they intend to do that or not, they're doing it. 
they couldn't be more effective than setting, having set out to do it with malice of forethought, because this is exactly where they're heading right now. Yeah. And um, the dialogue mass was being pushed by the Society of St. Pius X back when? I mean, I'm talking about 10, 15 years ago. The question is, and what was in my mind, why are they doing that? What possible purpose could it serve to be pushing the dialogue mass? And the only purpose I can see is they're inching the people in the direction of the Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't uh, make any sense otherwise. Well, Father, there's another question here along, along these same lines. Uh, where this, this viewer asks, have women always been permitted to join the church choir? Were the decrees of the 1950s concerning mixed choirs and choirs of women or girls simply an affirmation of longstanding practice, or were they something new in church history? Did these decrees concern the ecclesiastical choir of Levites or the choir of the faithful? What is the difference? Well, uh, if you go into the ancient basilicas in Rome uh, that are still pretty much intact, there aren't many that are still intact, but I, I think in, uh, immediately of San Clemente, San Clemente on the Via di San Giovanni in Laterano. And um, that is one of the most ancient basilicas in existence. In fact, it is considered one of the purest extant forms of the ancient Roman basilica in Rome. I don't know how many people even know enough to go there. It's a nice walk from the Colosseum straight to uh, St. John Lateran. And uh, when I take the students there, we always go to St. Clemente. It's one of my favorite places. But um, when you walk into St. Clemente, you go through the atrium, okay? And you come in the, the, the main doors, and you see before you a scola cantorum, okay? Now, this is very, very interesting to me, anyway, and it should be for anybody, because that <clears throat> the, the marble balustrade and all that of the Scola Cantorum, where the, the clergy of the basilica would gather for prayer, uh, <clears throat> was brought up from the, fourth, from the fourth century church. On that site was a fourth century basilica. At the same time, uh, Constantine was building St. Peter, building St. Peter's, and uh, and St. Paul's outside the walls, and so on. Uh, there were other basilicas that were built, <coughs> and uh, this beautiful basilica of St. Clemente was built. Um, now, <coughs> in the fourth century, um, you already had the Scola Cantorum, where the clergy of the Basilica would gather to, to chant the divine office. It has a very Byzantine flavor to the church, the architecture of the church. In the magnificent um, mosaic in the apse, beautiful, ancient. Uh, you have a very, very Greek flavor to it, a Byzantine flavor, to show how ancient it was. You know, it really, the most ancient of the basilicas. Well, um, go to San, Santa Maria in Trastevere. Look at the, <clears throat> look at the iconography there, in the mosaic in the apse. Go to Saint Mary Majors, and there you find again a very Byzantine flavor, in the mosaic in the in the in the. Um, in the, uh, the depictions of our Lord and our Blessed Mother and the saints and so on. It's very beautiful, very ancient. To us here in this country, it might at first seem kind of foreign, but then when you learn the history of it, you realize, no, this is exactly what it should be. You know? um, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> the point is that when this 4th century basilica uh, had been standing uh, for uh, 700 years. Uh, the, the building was not that secure or stable anymore. They'd see cracks and so on. So they determined to actually use the, the basilica itself, the walls, to fill in and build on top. They used the, the walls as foundation for another basilica. Now we're talking about the modern basilica that stands there now dating back to the 1100s, right? Or even before, you know. Um, so, you know, the idea of 
uh, an ancient over there has a different meaning. <laughs> it does hear this. Yeah. It's America. You know, we have no concept of these things. But anyway, um, so the basilica you're walking into has been standing for a thousand years. But that <clears throat> the architectural appointments of the basilica, the ancient basilica, were actually brought up and put in the modern basilica, the 11th century basilica. So that Scala Cantorum actually dates back to the 4th century basilica. And the monks, or the, the, the religious of the basilica, um, would gather there and, and chant the divine office, the Psalms, and so on in Latin, perhaps even in Greek. And, uh, and this was their choir. Um, now, when you have women religious, okay, they would gather and they would sing, but you wouldn't have the mixture of the men and the women. Um, so you would have choirs of women, mm -hmm. and you would have choirs of men. Uh, the choirs of men were actually clergy who were chanting the divine office and singing the mass while people attended. And uh, they would be in this area in, enclosed off the sanctuary, right in front of the altar, okay, with the balakino. And uh, they would sing. Now, if the question is, when did you start getting mixed choirs of men and women, okay? Um, <clears throat> those who were singing the liturgy in those days were consecrated to our Lord. They were clergy, or they were consecrated virgins, right? A la, you know, Saint, uh, Saint Jerome and his influence. So, um, so um, yeah, it, gradually over time, it, it, it took quite a while for the church to allow, and this was generally, I believe, in missionary lands, any mixture of the men and the women singing together. Um, at the time, it probably was considered to be an abuse, I suppose. I don't know. You know. I'd have to go back and check. It is not the ideal. You know, it's not what the church wants more than anything. Um, you have to, you know, even when polyphony was introduced, for example, the Sistine Chapel choir, you don't have men and women singing there. There are boys who are singing. Young lads are singing. It's sort of like the Vienna Boys Choir. And you'd have men and adolescent boy, uh, young men, and you'd have children, 10, even 9 and 8 years old, singing. That's where the polyphony would come in. Uh, the type of uh, polyphony they'd be singing back in the 1500s with Palestrina and uh, so on. So again, the idea of having in the church choir men and women singing together, um, this was... This was um, uh, I guess considered to be something of an innovation at the time. The church did not condemn it, though. And, um, you know, the church showed by that that this is not her first choice by any means. But I don't know that the church has ever formally condemned that because it was considered basically to be a... Um, I don't know if it was uh, considered an abuse or not. I used the word before. But a kind of a concession to the reality of the situation with a missionary effort of the church when she was uh, forging her way into foreign lands among pagans and receiving converts into the faith and so on. There are those listening out there who know this history much better than I. In fact, our organist here at Immaculate Conception, who is a very gifted and very... Um, um, educated uh, organist, and especially with church music, he could answer that question much better than I, and I'll have to ask him about that. Yeah. Um, the um, my ideal, anyway, and I think it's the church's ideal, would be to have a a choir of men and boys singing the mass. This takes nothing away from the ladies, the valiant ladies who are doing their very best, um, who play the organ when there's no one else to do so, but it's a great help, tremendous help, um, and uh, who sing in the liturgy of beautiful voices. Uh, for example, as you know, Tom, we have here the, uh, the tenebrae services, and we sing, uh, I think, Mozart's uh, Mis Miserere, mm -hmm. which uh, requires a, a soprano who can hit those. Yeah, it's just, um, it, it's just very moving, yeah. very, very moving, right? 
And um, you know, I thank fitness for providing those voices for us who can and will uh, make the effort to sing that so beautifully. Okay. In the old days, that would have been a young lad, though. <clears throat> would have been a lady. Uh, except the, the ladies would have sung in their houses with, with uh, women, religious. You know? mm -hmm. So I'd love to have a scola cantorum of men singers, but we, we just don't have the personnel for that. Mm -hmm. And even in, in our own, it's very hard to have that in a, peri in a parish setting today. Uh, to have a, you know, a, a, an assortment of males who can give the time and the effort and the expertise to get together on a regular basis to practice and sing, and let that be the backbone of the um, liturgical music in the parish, it's well nigh impossible mm -hmm. in, in, in reality. So... Um, but anyway, I would be very hesitant to necessarily call it an abuse, although there are those out there who might know it is and can actually show us the documentation for it. I think it was something the church tolerated then. I mean, you go into San Clemente, where, where I started talking yeah. about this, right? You go into San Clemente, and you uh, walk up toward the Scola Cantor. You look 90 degrees to your right, and you're looking into the sacristy. You go into the sacristy. They have like a, a booth set up there, okay? It's not so much a sacristy, really. It's a bookstore, more or less, really. And they have a booth set up there and where they're selling you uh, passes at these tests today to go down the steps into the excavations, okay? The excavations of the 4th century basilica took place um, in the 1800s and early 1900s by the Dominicans of Ireland, to whom the church was committed, it is still in their care. And they uh, undertook the excavation of the 4th century basilica, very painstaking effort, labor intensive, but also they had to know what they were doing. They didn't want to destroy anything or miss anything, however tiny it might be. I mean, in these digs, sometimes they, they'll go through something with a, with a teaspoon. Mm -hmm. So um, they uncovered the frescoes from the 900s. I mean, from the 900s. Beautiful, vibrant frescoes detailing the arrival of the relics of St. Cyril and Methodius brought to that church. And uh, you go in through the walkways that were now, that were for all those centuries packed with, packed with dirt and debris, right? They've all been cleared out. Now you can walk through those doors once again. They're well lit. You walk through. You're walking on the original pavement, 4th century basilica. We're talking about 300s. And you see frescoes in there you know, that go back to, to even the, the three or four hundreds. Uh, in fact, you even see there uh, elements of uh, Christian iconography that go back many years. For example, you see a, a portrait of a saint with a round halo, but you see also under the square halo, which means the individual was still alive. It's a portrait of one of the popes, but he was still alive at the time that this was made. Okay. And uh, <coughs> you walk through, in that basilica, because there are no pews, they stood, okay? But the men stood on one side, and the women stood on the other. The, the men and the boys on one side, the women and the girls on the other. They did not mix. Interesting. Okay? That's the way it was done in those days. And uh, so I guess it would be considered an abuse for us to even allow a family to sit together. The men and the women, the boys and the girls. And where did that come in? I don't know. You, know, you could even go back uh, not too many centuries in Europe, and you'd find they still kept that designation. Why? Same way, the reason they have uh, ball boys, girls, and all girls' schools. I mean, co-education was considered an innovation. You know? Boys and girls were considered to be a distraction to each other. Lo and behold, right? <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, yeah, those, those are different times, you know, um, when people had a little common sense, you know, faced reality. And they thought, we're not here to flirt, uh, we're here to worship God, and this is the way we should do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you walk up to the front, um, where the original altar would have stood, there's a, a, a structure there now. You go through one of the side, to the, one of the side aisles there, you find the ancient baptistry. It's still there. 
In fact, from there you can even you can even go down around the apps or what was the the apps at the time, and there's a stairway that takes you down to a. A first century Roman street. It's basically an alleyway. First century Roman street. And you realize, hey, first century Roman street. I'm walking through Rome right now that was burned out by Nero. That whole area was burned out by Nero to build his golden house, Domus Aurea. I mean, this is historical. You know, you're walking down this alleyway. You're going past an opening that goes into, into an old Mithraic temple, which was, I guess some say, the big, the greatest rival of Christianity for the allegiance of the people in the empire. empire the Mithraism drew a lot of the soldiery of Rome into its grasp. Hmm. But Christianity, Christ, drew more and more you read that in the lives of the martyrs of the, of the early Christian soldiers who gave their lives for our Lord. And uh, so you realize, boy, I'm really, I'm, I'm back with, right at the heart of things. You're walking actually among the walls of a first century Christian home that harbored the apostles. And uh, you get to the end of that walkway, you're pretty far underground now. And uh, you hear the rushing of the Cloaca Maxima, the great sewer of Rome, where St. Clement, uh, Clemens Flavius was drowned, and was martyred there. But it's flowing right, right by this first century, right underneath, you know, outside the walls underground of this, of this, uh, this uh, patrician home of the first century. So, um... It's it's really a very important experience for our youngsters to experience, to see that, and touch it, you know, be there. Uh, so uh, this Basilica of San Clemente is one of is my third favorite place to visit in Rome. You can tell I have a certain, <laughs> um, what should I say, devotion to the place, right? Um, but this question about the singing and the male and the female voices being mixed and so on. Um, it, it is a very good question and a very interesting historical question. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what point the church made its peace with the men and women choirs, men and women, women in a mixed choir, but it was a gradual thing. It was an acceptance um, uh, and something tolerated. Okay? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the original plan. Gotcha. There were things that did develop in the church over time as she spread and spread uh, throughout the world, though. But nothing was in contradiction to the church's practice, principles, precepts, um, such as you find in modernism. There you find a complete contradiction. So, uh, in any case... If uh, anybody wants to join a male scuola cantorum, um, yeah. uh, more down. power to you. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, to go ahead and do it. Uh, Father, I think we have time for one more question here. This viewer says, uh, the Bible says that we are the created in the image and likeness of God. Does this still apply to post-fall humanity, or was the image corrupted? And I'd like, Father, for you to answer this question in light of Francis' uh, recent words concerning uh, oh, yeah. the nature of, of God, I guess, where he says that God cannot be God without man. So what, what is, what is the, the nature of man, the nature of God? How do those interact? And what is the... Well, the sacred scripture does say that God created man his own image and likeness and that's mm -hmm. true Genesis right, right. and um, traditionally that's been understood to mean that God created man by human nature in God's image and by grace in his likeness okay. um, what's the distinction well you may have a child okay and you may say okay this child, say a son, is just the very image of his father. In other words, he looks just like him. The spitting image of his father, to use the expression. Um, because he looks like him, you know. He has the appearance of his dad. But you go beyond that when you say he's in the likeness 
because the likeness is not just the appearance, the sound of the voice, the mannerisms, it goes deeper than that. And so it is, if I were to say he looks like his father, I could say he's the image of his father, in appearance only. If I say he's just like his father, I mean a lot more. And so it is with the creation of uh, the human race, the creation of Adam. God made Adam by Adam's nature as a human being to resemble God in terms of the powers of Adam's soul. His soul, a spiritual reality, okay, spiritual substance. Um, although, you know, an incomplete substance as far as the soul was designed by God to be united with the body, okay? But the soul itself is spiritual and immortal like God in that regard, okay? And the soul has powers. Uh, the power of intellect to know truth, the power of will to love goodness, and the power to enjoy what is beautiful, These are the so-called transcendentals, the true, the good, the beautiful. This is what defines, by nature, the image of God in man. That makes us very resemble God, okay? That we have those powers. Uh, Because, essentially, we have the power to do what God does, to know truth. We we not only know true things, we know what truth is. We have an idea of what what truth even means unto itself. Even if you're thinking about nothing in particular that is true or false, the very concept of what truth is, we understand what that means. Goodness, okay, the concept of what goodness is, even apart from any particular good thing. (coughs) And beauty also. We talk about beauty, we sing about it, we write about it. Even just beauty unto itself, you know, how important it is, how wonderful it is. And, um, and in that, we have the natural image of God in man, that we can do these things. And the fact is that God created us this way so that even by nature, we can know him and we can love him and we can serve him. Even on a natural level, we can know God as the supreme being and creator. Okay, even on the natural level, you know, the intellectual power of mind to know this, and the the power, volitional power to love this is good. This was defined actually as dogma as of our Catholic faith by Vatican Council One, that the human intellect has the power to know God, as Saint Paul says, through His works here in creation. Okay, far beyond that goes divine revelation and the knowledge we have of God through the way he has revealed himself, through the prophets and so on, and and ultimately through our Lord Jesus Christ. As our Lord said, Father Philip, have you not known me? Do you not know that he who sees me sees the Father? So there's the revelation of God in Christ personally, Jesus Christ. Um, Now that is not nature, that is grace. Okay? So, by sanctifying grace, Adam was created with the supernature, the supernatural life of grace. And so he actually shared in the divine life already at his creation. Um, He lost that by sin. He lost that participation in the supernatural life of God by his sin. And uh, what else happened to him? Uh, even his nature was crippled, as it were. The preternatural gifts, you have the natural, the preternatural, and the supernatural, okay? The natural is what we have by just the nature that God created us with, you know, as he designed us. The supernatural is a matter of grace and the, the sanctifying grace of participation in God's life. The preternatural gifts are gifts that are above our natural powers, um, but they are still within the province of what is natural. They're sort of add-ons, you might say, to our nature. Immortality, right? impassibility, uh, we can suffer, right? Infused knowledge. These are all things that God gave us, just as gifts. He created us. He created Adam and Eve. <clears throat> Those were lost. Those were lost also. No, Adam and Eve were created with infused knowledge. It's not as if they forgot everything. 
overnight, you know. Um, they lost immortality. They lost impassibility. Now they would have to die. Now they would have to suffer. They lost a certain dominion over creation. They still had the power of reason that gave them a certain advantage. But they're not a real dominion over nature. They lost that. And then, even the natural things, intellect and will, were hampered. Intellect was darkened, will was weakened. So the passions now could dominate. And that was a terrible thing. We saw the results of that with Cain murdering his brother Abel. Right? We saw jealousy, we saw hatred, we saw all of that rise up and uh, dominate. The, and that's history. I mean, you know, people deny these things. They deny original sin. They deny, uh, but, you know, like, all you have to do, I'm not recommending it necessarily, you turn on the news and read it, pick up the newspaper, anything. I mean, it's all about you know, what people are doing to people. <laughs> Uh, it's all about original sin. It's the story of original sin, human news, you know. And even the fascination that people have with evil and the warped and the distorted and the twisted, you know. It's all original sin. Mm. So, yeah, human nature itself was crippled, but it wasn't destroyed. Luther said we destroyed our nature. We didn't have the power to destroy it. Uh, we suffered the consequences, like a crippling disease like polio. Even after with baptism you heal the disease, the crippling effects remain. In, in regards to original sin, I believe it was uh, was Chesterton, and I'm paraphrasing. I believe he says something along the lines of, uh, "No matter what <coughs> specifically is wrong with the human race, there's no denying that something is That's wrong something is wrong, wrong with right? the human race." But how 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 does it make sense, Father, to say that we have this corrupted human nature and this corrupted human race? How does it make sense for Francis to say that God cannot be God without this corrupted man? Tom, this is, this is really awful what the man says. I mean, it's hard to speak about these things impassively because they are so blatantly offensive and blasphemous Blasphemy, to God. Blasphemy, yeah. I mean, I know it sounds, it sounds disrespectful to talk about Francis this way, but I'm sorry, he has no problem speaking disrespectfully of God. He has no problem with that. Yeah. And uh, it is outrageous what this man says. And if this is a revelation of his mind and his, and his will, if this is a revelation of his soul, then we really have to fear for his salvation. You know, I mean, this is really, this is awful. Uh, I, I have an article which was just given to me, as you know. Uh, this is actually on the www.lifesitenews.com website. Uh, the date of this is June 7th, 1917, okay? 2017, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm going back 100 years to uh, Fatima. Um, so the, the, the headline title is Pope Francis Says God Cannot Be God Without Man. And then they say, and we need another clarification. <laughs> I'm sorry, but every time he opens his mouth to clarify, somebody else has to come up and try to try to make sense out of what he says or somehow reconcile this with reality, faith, whatever. It, has, it doesn't work. I mean, I'm sorry. It's not that the emperor has no clothes, it's the pope has no faith. If that, I mean, he's a pope of the Novus Ordo, he's a, he's a modernist. He's the pope of modernism is what he is, and he speaks like it too. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't hurt to read this, it's not a long article. Um, I want to go and I want to check the original. I presume he said this in Italian, he was a dateline Vatican, so. Pope Francis again sparked calls for clarification today. As he stated before the crowds in St. Peter's Square, quote, God cannot be God without man. What was he before he created Adam? <laughs> huh? What was he? The cosmic mushroom or something? I mean, this is what the modernists would have you say. I remember sitting in the classroom with a nun, a Dominican nun, still in vestiges of a Dominican habit, uh, tell, a asking our 12th grade class, when do you think Jesus realized, first realized that he was God? Oh boy. That's when I saw uh, the other kids in class who had never had a thought or expressed a thought the entire year. Suddenly they woke up like, what was that? Mm -hmm. And now they all started thinking, hmm, that's a very good question. Yeah. 
I, I suppose to a modernist, that's success. Oh, look, we got we actually got somebody to think about these things. But I mean, by asking these crazy blasphemous questions, you get people to think. I mean, so you start asking people nonsense questions, and yet you can get, you know, the deep thinkers, the people who really thought about their faith, are kind of hitting their heads on the desk, saying, uh, I, you know, tilt, tilt, tilt. This doesn't make sense. And the others, uh, they start taking it very seriously. I guess this is what the modernists want. Father, I think there was there was an entire film that was recently made. I forget the exact title, but uh, perhaps it was something along the lines of Becoming Christ or something like that. Oh, okay. Where, um, Becoming Christ? Something along the lines of that. I'm not sure exactly. But uh, the, the, the storyline from what I gathered was that... Uh, the Blessed Mother and Saint Joseph had to uh, had had to somehow teach the the child Jesus that he was God that he was God made man to uh, and and he was made to die on the cross and all this and they had to teach this they had to reveal this to them slowly over time and and, and he had to learn to accept that. And well, all you know something, Tom. In our own day and age, the way kids are, uh, parents are raising their kids to be God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that you can have parents do that. Yeah. But the Blessed Mother and Saint Joseph to say that they did that, yeah. that is an outrageous blasphemy. Exactly. You know? I mean, the way these young, young kids are raised right now with a sense of entitlement, yeah, you'd think that they believe, that they can't believe they're all God because their mommies and daddies, you know, convince them that they're God, and they're meant to be worshipped, right? It's the oldest trick in the book. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, unfortunately, yeah, but it is not our faith, it is not our Lord. It is blasphemy to suggest it. It is blasphemy to suggest that our Lord never knew, did not know that he was God, yeah. and all of a sudden it dawned on him one day. That's pure modernism. Uh, that, now there's an oxymoron. Pure modernism, right? It's like pure mortal sin. Uh, pure fornication. Pure adult. I mean, it's... It, no. Catholic Francis. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> the Pope was speaking from a written text at his Wednesday general audience. Now, again, you know, some people say, oh, he just speaks off the cuff, and he's speaking very roughly, and he speaks in generalities, so you can't really hold him to anything. He doesn't actually mean what he says. Oh, great. Well, that's very reassuring, right? Even better. He's speaking from a written text here. According to theologians who spoke with LifeSight, there was a danger the phrase by itself could be taken in an erroneous way. <laughs> you think? <laughs> well, that, that's highly possible. In context, the Pope said, Dear, and when I say taken in an erroneous way, I don't mean by the way, when they say taken an erroneous way, they mean in a way that could be against the faith. I say taken an erroneous way such that you try to make it Catholic, but that's not what Francis means. That's the erroneous way to take it. In context, the Pope said, Dear brothers and sisters, we are never alone. We can be far hostile. We can even say we are without God. But Jesus Christ's gospel reveals to us that God cannot be without us. He will never be a God without man. It is he who cannot be without us. And this is a great mystery. God cannot be God without man. This is a great mystery. Well, Francis, it sure is. Um, <clears throat> this, this is outrageously blasphemous. I mean, how close can you come to apostasy? You know? To say something like that. Um, and to mean it. <coughs> okay, without man, what is he then? <laughs> what is he? If he's not God without man, when there's, when, <clears throat> before he created Adam and Eve, what was he? The, the demiurge? Hmm? Was he one of the genie? Was he uh, one of the eons of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Gnostics? Uh, what, what, was, what, is, what is Francis's idea of God? It is not ours as Catholics. It is not the concept of the Catholic faith. No one has ever said something like that in the Catholic Church without being condemned right, um, for it. 
And um, this is, again, it hurts to even think of this. And it's hard to even speak of it without being very upset about it because it is such an attack on our Lord. It is such an outrageous attack on God himself. And the, the worst part is, Father, that, that he gets a free pass when he says all these things simply because he, he wears the white robes and, and lives in the Vatican and no one, mm-hmm. no one ever confronts him, no one ever asks him these hard questions. Why does no one ever say, what, if, if God cannot be God without man, what was God before man? Well, you know, there was a time when even the priests of the Society of St. Pius X would have mentioned this and told the people this. Now they can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Now they won't because now they're looking to get Francis his blessing. <clears throat> And uh, they're asking Francis to let them back into his, mm-hmm. into his church, okay? They want his approval. And the argument <clears throat> when somebody says, when anyone says, well, how can you do this because he's such a radical modernist? Their answer is, but that's the whole point. He's such a radical modernist now <clears throat> that he's willing to let everybody, you know, he's willing to give a pass to everybody. And only under someone like Francis could we be accepted back in. So the reason they're giving is a very reason that should scare people off and make them think, whoa, you mean he's so bad that he doesn't even care anymore? Nothing, it doesn't even matter to him? That um, matters of faith and, and morals, he's willing to accept any form of contradiction. Uh, into his church and you ask them don't you realize that by accepting this by pursuing this and accepting it too you are actually the poster child for modernism that you are saying it doesn't matter you can amalgamate yourself in the same church with with an outfit that has a different faith even a contrary faith a different religion even a contrary religion and all find uh, you know find place under the same big tent isn't that the, the apotheosis of modernism? Isn't that the central point of modernism? And you are endorsing it. You are actually going to become the prime representative of the success of this principle of ecumenism. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, they don't want to hear it. And this is, this is uh, I'm sorry, it's the great Kool-Aid. Okay, it's the zombie... It's, it, 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 it's the zombie attack here. They've got all these people following blindly on this path. <clears throat> and the very reason that they give why we should do this is the primary reason why this should have nothing to do with it. Yeah. That Francis is so open that, yeah, he's willing to let anybody in, even us. Mm-hmm. How wonderful. Yeah, Father, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it seems to me that, that a, a standard, acceptable, reasonable, logical way of reasoning things out and, and, and arguing things is to start with a principle, carry it out to, to its conclusion, and to see where that leads. So, for, for example, if you take abortion, you can't, abortion is, is uh, unreasonable because if you aborted every single baby, the human race would, would cease to exist. So if you carry that principle out to its, to its nat- natural conclusion, uh, you, you have a disaster. So we can tell right away, reasonably, logically, that that principle... I mean, even without faith. Exactly. Just, just by, by right, pure human sure. reasoning. Yeah. That, that, so that, that act is, 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 uh, is wrong and unreasonable. Unless your, your goal is to destroy the human race. Yeah. And you say, well, that's the way to go. That's very reasonable. Exactly. Considering my starting point. So why can the, the society seeing Pius X not apply that to their logic, their, their, their reasoning here? If, if we start with this principle of we have to uh, obey the Pope, we have to explain away Francis's words and all this. Look at the look at the, the result, or look at the, uh, the the timeline that he's following. We started with with traditionalism, and we're we're slowly slowly progressing towards modernism. And he's saying more and more outrageous things every day. On this 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 slippery slope that we're going down, eventually we're going to get to the point where, like Saint Pius X said, modernism lead, leads to atheism. What what is the society Saint Pius the Tenth going to do then? One when, when Francis gets up and says there is no God, they're still going to find Francis. By that time, there will no longer be. A, th- they'll still. Tom, there will be no longer a be a society of Saint Pius X. Yeah. But 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 how do they not see that, that that how do they not just take that principle, follow it through to its natural logical conclusion, and ask themselves when Francis gets up, as he inevitably will, it may not be him, but maybe a, a future <laughs> pontiff. Inevitably, they will stand up and pronounce to the world there is no God. 
How do they explain away those words? They remind me of the boys from Brooklyn. Sorry. One year at camp, we had a tent full of boys from Brooklyn. Okay. And they would not be quiet. They were excited to be at camp. We're talking about nine, ten year old kids, right? Maybe 11, 12 mixed in there. <clears throat> and this council had a, a tent of their own. They all grabbed it together. They're all from Brooklyn, you know, Brooklyn boys. And, all. <clears throat> and they would not be quiet. So 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, you know. You, go ahead and well, you guys have to be quiet. Let everybody else sleep, you know. And uh, <clears throat> they were just so excited. So finally, I came out there. And I was fairly nearly ordained. So I said, well, look, if you boys don't be quiet, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to you know, give you a punishment. <laughs> so they all saying, oh, what do, we, what, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? What do we have to do? <laughs> and I think, oh, great. <laughs> if you don't be quiet, I'm going to get you all together, and we're going to spend the rest of the night going up, and we're going we're gonna to pick up all the trash in the camp. <laughs> well, they were all about that. <laughs> they were so excited about that. They leaped to their feet, <clears throat> almost formed a line spontaneously, and I can tell you, quote unquote, they're saying, oh boy, we get to pick up garbage. We get to pick up garbage. That was like the mantra. We get to pick up garbage. Okay. So at that point, I was not happy, but I think, oh great, we get to pick up garbage. So I take them out and we get to pick up garbage. Okay. So that's what we're doing at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Until there was no more garbage to be picked up, and they were very disappointed, and they had to go back to the tent and finally get some sleep. You know? But it's almost like, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, this is what comes to mind in the Society of St. Pius X. It's like, we can all get back with Francis. <clears throat> but do we want to do this? <clears throat> but this is our only chance to do this. It's our only chance to do this because, I mean, any other pope who still believed in truth and, and moral principles wouldn't, wouldn't have us back in. <clears throat> They would say, no, you don't agree with this, you don't agree with that. You will not accept Vatican II, right? <coughs> and so on. So we can't have you back with us because there's a contradiction. But Francis doesn't care about contradiction. He's so far gone, and he's so completely far gone, that he's not even a rational being anymore. <coughs> that's exactly, that's the only kind of pontiff who would even allow us back in. So we have to go for it now. Well, we've got Francis to get back in before, <clears throat> who knows? <clears throat> they might elect somebody now, uh, next who, who, who says, no, I mean, we, we, we've got to draw the line somewhere because Francis will draw the line nowhere. So if they get somebody and starts drawing lines again, then <clears throat> we're going to find the door's not going to open. But now the drawbridge has come down, the portcullis has come up, <clears throat> and <clears throat> we can go streaming across the moat. <clears throat> And, uh, and 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 be home again <coughs> in uh, in Francis's Vatican and Francis's church. When you ask them, but wait a minute, um, that's not the Catholic Church. That's not the Catholic faith. It's not the Catholic religion. And they say, well, actually, we know. We agree with you there. <laughs> So you say, <clears throat> but you're going to be in the church with Francis, in that church, with its non-Catholic faith, as non-Catholic religion, and you're going to say, oh, we're bringing the Catholic faith and Catholic religion, and we're all going to be together in the same church. Can that be the, same, the church established by Christ with two different mutually exclusive religions and two different mutually exclusive faiths? The one, the faith of modernism, the belief of modernism, the other, the, belief of the faith of Catholicism. The one, the religion that follows from the faith of modernism, modernist principles, and the other, the religion that is putting Catholicism into practice, <clears throat> you say they're mutually inimical to each other. Your patron, St. Pius X, said that they are absolutely polar opposites, and they, they, one must destroy the other, <laughs> right? And, uh, and you say, you're going to pretend that you belong, that you're in the same church with this? What madness is this? <clears throat> but believe me, they cannot see the madness of it all. When you ask them that way, they will not answer you. They don't want to see it because they see an opportunity. I'm telling you, again, it's, it's, um, it's the bridge over the River Kwai. 
It is, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> We're going to build the bestest bridge in the whole world for these guys and show them good old British, you know, ingenuity, uh, in ingenuity and hard work, even though these are the enemy who are sending uh, trainloads of munitions to, to, to destroy our country and to... To murder, uh, to, 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 to kill thousands and thousands of Britishers. <clears throat> we're going to do this because we're going to show them something. We're going to prove something to them this way. Well, they're going to prove something to them, all right. <clears throat> and what they're going to prove to them is <clears throat> that, they, that they're right. Mm. They're going to prove that, to them that they are right. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, I know I'm reaching for different stories here, but, you know, you try to get through to them because they're not thinking rationally. You don't want to hear this. Tom, Tom Anderson told the story, I think I might have mentioned here three or four or five times, about the hunter who went into the woods. You know, he wanted to get his wife a fur coat. He goes into the woods, and he's hunting the bear, okay? <clears throat> Comes into a clearing, and there's the bear. <clears throat> and uh, the bear and the hunter are squared off, and the hunter raises his rifle, aims it at the bear, and the bear <clears throat> puts out his paw and says, Wait a minute, Mr. Hunter. <clears throat> Please, you know, just hear me out. <clears throat> Don't be in a rush to kill me. <clears throat> After all, I'm just a poor bear. <clears throat> I have no gum. I'm just looking for nuts and berries to eat. That's all. I'm minding my business. I wasn't bothering you. <clears throat> and after all, <clears throat> maybe there's a way we can negotiate. Let's try to negotiate this out. I mean, all you want is a fur coat for your wife, right? You just want the fur coat. And all I'm looking for is a full stomach. So let's sit down and talk this over. And the hunter <clears throat> lowers his rifle and thinks, well, you know, <clears throat> that's pretty reasonable. I mean, I can't argue with the reasoning there. It makes sense. Let's see if we can both get what we want, because if we can both get what we want, then that's much better than my just getting what I want. You know? mm -hmm. So they sat down, and they actually did negotiate. They talked it over. And sure enough, they both got what they wanted that night. <clears throat> the hunter got his fur coat, and the bear got a full stomach, if you catch my drift. And this is what I see happening here. <clears throat> but... Uh, you know, to try to talk to the people of the society, it's like they're in a trance. Yeah. It's like they are entranced by this idea, which is so dangerous, um, more than dangerous. It's suicidal for the traditional faith. Yeah. Yeah, you, you cannot compromise with something like this. Mm -hmm. um, the, the very, as I say, the very idea, the very explanation they're giving, we have to do this now because Francis is so completely... Um, <coughs> Uncatholic in his thinking, that he's the only he, he's the big chance we have to get back in. Um, well, I mean, when you say that about about Francis, I mean, you're actually saying a lot more mm -hmm. than they're willing to admit. But I thought it'd be important to just finish up here and read what he says. John Paul Meenan, professor of theology at Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, a Catholic college in eastern Ontario told LifeSite News that while the second phrase, God cannot be God without man, is open to misinterpretation, the Pope's first wording, he will never be a God without man, is less problematic since it is in the future tense, since God is now in an eternal covenant with man. Professor Meenan said it is not true that God cannot be God without man in a universal sense. Here we find the dance. Here we, the parsing of the words, okay? What's he saying here? <laughs> Some people scratch your head. <clears throat> when Francis says God will never be a God without man, <clears throat> okay, he says, <clears throat> well, it's true that, in fact, from this moment on, in the future, God will never be without man because he created man. Man will always be there. So, obviously, God will never be without man. But if Francis says in Italian, God will never be a God without man, yeah, you, know, you gotta wonder, okay, you know, uh, where, where is Arius when you need him? You know? And the rest of these, the Gnostics, the same thing, you know? And, uh, 
But the, he says the second phrase, God cannot be God without man. Now that means it's impossible, technically speaking, if you take the words carefully, God cannot be God without man. And uh, again, I mean, it, there's nowhere to go with that one. Mm-hmm. I want to see the Italian to make sure it's correct, but um, I mean, Francis is... is, is um, you wonder just how, how far he, he can go before they, they just have to admit that what he's saying is blasphemy, a heresy. Menon was particularly concerned about the statement because it could be taken to support a modernist falsehood known as process theology, which posits God perfects himself by creation or grows with creation. Well, that process theology is exactly what modernism is all about. It's exactly what Francis is all about. He's always talking about the evolving church. That's what I was talking about in the sermon last Sunday. Another credentialed Catholic lay theologian known to LifeSite News but wishing to remain anonymous explained, Because of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is true that God remains eternally joined to mankind through the human nature of Jesus Christ. Second of the three divine persons of the Most Blessed Trinity. Nonetheless, God has absolutely no actual need of mankind, our relationship with God being entirely dependent on that gratuitous superabundance of the infinite divine love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the theologian added. Um, Then he quotes uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon uh, with a couple of quotes. Which, which you're fine, and I, I recommend people go and look for this um, article on LifeSite News. Pope Francis says God cannot be God without man. Now, I, I would just say this. I mean, they can discuss this uh, until their eyes cross, the cows come home, and, uh, you know, in, and Fernum freezes over. But the point is, if Francis, Francis is saying uh, that that God cannot be God without man, then he's suggesting all kinds of things that can be inferred from that statement. And um, this, is, this would be heresy in its own right. Okay? Now, if one were to ask Francis himself to explain it, um, heaven only knows what he would come out with then, okay? This is why they're, they're trying to kind of contain him, but they can't. Um, but uh, it gets to the point where, where someone comes out with this continuous stream of what the French called bêtise. Okay, this is, a bêtise, bêtise. This is more than bêtise, though. This is, uh, uh, this is much worse than that. And you begin to realize there's a whole mentality behind this, Tom. It's undeniable. And you might be able to explain away this or that, but you can't explain away everything. Finally, in the end, you just can't explain away everything. Uh, So um, I really do think people should enter in themselves and realize that uh, no matter what else we may say about those mad city of accountants, or mad cities, as they like to call them, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, they, those, those people who have this knee-jerk reaction um, uh, to justify Francis and whatever he says or does, and to attack those who even, even have judged that he's not the Pope, these people have to face reality. And um, when, they, when they go on the rampage, hurling all kinds of insults at those who question, or even more than doubt, uh, deny, and say they're convinced that Francis is not the Pope, those, they have to realize something. It's not the fault of the Sadie Vicantis, so called. It's not the fault of the so called mad Sadies, is like the, like the hurl the insults. It is the fault of Francis. It is the fault of all of these modernist pontiffs who have done this to us all. And they've got to start uh, realizing where the problem is and stop this nonsense of attacking those who want to hold on to the traditional faith uh, and are determined to do so. Because these people are actually on a headlong uh, path straight into the jaws of modernism. Um, The fact... It's one thing 
it's one thing to criticize the Society of St. Pius X and those who are blindly following the path that they're being led on right now. It's one thing to criticize them justly for wanting to reunite with, I said not reunite, but to unite themselves with Francis, even though they recognize that he does not speak, teach, represent the Catholic faith. But another thing that is, I think, even more de- condemning of them is that in the process of doing this, they are turning around and hurling insults and attacks against those who want, who are simply practicing the traditional faith. That, to me, is a real indication of what we're dealing with here. And what we're dealing with here is, is Jonestown. What we're dealing with here is uh, an entire organization uh, which was not established by Archbishop Lefebvre to do this. The whole thing is being subverted right now, being delivered on a platter like 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 Salome, Salome the dancing girl delivers the head of John the Baptist on a plate to to Herod, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's awful to see this happening. Yeah. If you're with the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth, I'd suggest this this is definitely the time to um, say that you are you, they are not going to drink the Kool Aid. Mm-hmm. And Father, unfortunately, there's uh, there's so much more that could be said about this. There, there there's so much uh, so much more advice that you could give. But uh, using the uh, Society of St. Pius X, one of their their favorite arguments, anytime you try and uh, criticize in any way Francis or the Novus Ordo Pontiffs, they'll say instead of criticizing him, why don't you spend that time praying for him? And I say, okay, there's some truth to that, but. Uh, and, well, that's assuming we don't. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. But I mean, I pray that he will uh, do convert and save his soul. <laughs> yeah. But you know, they can say that all they want. But the fact is, if they look again as traditional Catholics at what the Church traditionally does, mm-hmm. the Catholic Church doesn't say that. The Catholic Church never said, "Don't criticize heretics. Don't criticize blasphemers. Don't criticize those who are guilty of sacrilege. Just pray for them." The Catholic Church herself traditionally has never adopted that mm-hmm. that policy. She has always condemned heresy, blasphemy, and sacrilege. And so must we, you know? Um, our Lord. I mean, I, I could just I could just see these people saying to our Lord, or, or even to Saint Pius X. Oh, oh, uh, you know, Holy Father, don't waste your time with that encyclical. Don't waste your time condemning the errors of the modernists. Just pray for them. Can you imagine St. Pius the death and what he would say to them <laughs> about that? So again, I mean, they are, they're not traditional. They're simply not following Catholic tradition. It's a lie and a fraud for the Society of St. Pius the to be pretending that they're following Catholic tradition in taking the position they are. All of their arguments to justify this are, are completely contrary to Catholic tradition. People have to wake up and realize that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And admit it. Yep. Well, I think the uh, the most important thing is that we do continue to pray for them. So we'll. Well, we're going to pray for them. That's for sure. But at the same time, we're going to show them that they're, <laughs> they're on the wrong track. Exactly. That's the plan, anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, but th- thanks for being here tonight. Absolutely, Tom. Thank it. you. Yep. No problem. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.